Hello, I'm Jenny Murray and this is Now I'm Grown Up. Before we start today's episode, I have a recommendation for you. It's hosted by Dr. James Mannion from the UCL Institute of Education. The Rethinking Education podcast features inspiring guests talking about how we might reform education so as to bring about a more harmonious, less hair-raising state of world affairs. This podcast has given rise to a thriving online community, which brings the voices of young people and others into this urgent conversation. Subscribe to Rethinking Education, Education's Critical Friend. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. We all know that we go to school to learn, but what exactly we're learning is harder to define. Is it fact and theories, equations and quotations, or are we learning less tangible skills like confidence, resilience and how to work in teams? I'm Jenny Murray and this is Now I'm Grown Up, a podcast about living longer, career change and education. Each week we've heard from people who've returned to the classroom and how they're grown up to retrain as teachers in their chosen subjects. But a maths teacher rarely just teaches maths and an English teacher doesn't just cover English. The lessons that children learn at school stretch far beyond the curriculum. On today's episode, we'll be asking what schools are really for. To inspire minds, to pass exams, or just keep kids off the Xbox. When I was at school, I certainly felt they were for reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now, I'm not so sure. And joining me to debate this fascinating topic is Lucy Kellaway, whom you may remember from our very first episode. Lucy was a journalist at the Financial Times for more than three decades until four years ago. She swapped columns for school reports and retrained as an economics teacher. And not only that, each year she persuades hundreds of other professionals to do the same as the co-founder of the education charity Now Teach. We also have Geoffrey Quay, National Director of Education and Standards at the Aspirations Academies Trust, which equip students at 15 UK academies with GCSEs and A-levels, as well as the skills they need to succeed in a changing world. He's also an inspector for the education regulator Ofsted and an advisor to the Department of Education. Well, Lucy and Geoffrey, before we even attempt to answer these very big questions, I'd like to play you a short clip where we hear from a retrained teacher herself, what she thinks schools are for. I'm Anne-Marie Lawler and I started to train as a teacher in 2017. I teach French and Latin and I'm also a careers coordinator at my school. I was a civil servant for a very long time, um, including for quite a long time in the Department for Education. Um, I had in fact left that a couple of years previous and was doing various uh, different sorts of things when the battle cry to join the army of retraining teachers sounded and I started training as a teacher with Now Teach. Oh, I think schools have many, many points. I, I do think the subjects are important. I do think it is important that children, teenagers learn about maths and English and science and all of those things. Definitely that's part of the point. But a very large part of the point also, it seems to me, is learning how to be with other people. And increasingly, out of school, young people spend a lot of time perhaps at a computer screen in activities that are done alongside other people but not necessarily with other people. And so I think a big part is teaching teaching young people how to work together, how to want to work with other people, how to get the best out of themselves and other people. And then the last thing is to have ambition for themselves, to have ambition for them themselves and their careers and what they can do with their lives and also what they want the world to be like. Teaching has changed how I think about what school is for, I think, because I came into it because I was very driven about teaching the subject that I started out teaching, which is, is French, which I, I still teach. I don't think I realised quite how important schools are to helping young people learn how to be and learn how to 
be with each other and learn how to learn about the world. And that's it's all the more exciting as far as I'm concerned. That's all the more all the more important and all the more interesting and something I, I want very much to be a part of. Anne-Marie Lawler. Lucy, what did you think schools were for when you were a pupil at a school? Oh, gosh. Well, it was a very, very long time ago. I think that, that back then I thought schools were for hanging out with my friends um, I mean, I was very different to the sort of pupils who Anne-Marie teaches and who I teach myself. I was very privileged. I came from a house full of books. So I sort of thought that education was something that people just always have. And I think I took it for granted. I went to a really wonderful grammar school in North London. And I kind of thought, Everyone had an experience like that, that education somehow just rubs off on you. And even if, like me, you ended up not actually acquiring very much, things would be all right in the end. And they were for me. So I think I had a really ungrateful attitude towards it. You know, I just utterly took it for granted. And the bits I didn't take for granted were the sort of fun bits with my friends. And Geoffrey, what did you think schools were for when you were a pupil at one? Yeah, well, I think similar to um, the point Lucy made, um, I think initially it's about your friendship groups and wanting to be with your friends in school. But I thought um, I had um, an upbringing where my parents, um, in particular, I think my my mum being a teacher, instilled the idea of um, school is for learning. So, you know, taking your learning always seriously is quite a requirement that was instilled in me at a very young age. But I think I encountered other pupils that were just going through the motions of school and didn't really see the point in undertaking some of the activities and learning. But broadly, for me, I feel school is a place that you learn the basics and that sets you up for life. And what do you think school is for now? I think my perception of school now has slightly shifted from when I was at school. I think school is a place where, you know, you provide pupils, um, what I'll say, knowledge, skills and understanding to be able to become responsible adults and citizens to change the world and play an active part in solving the challenges that, you know, we encounter day in, day out in the world. And I think schools are well-equipped in doing that, but then at at different levels of success, depending on which school you are in. How easy, Lucy, is it to learn to be a teacher who's going to teach something besides their special subject? I almost wish I had that problem. Um, So I teach in a very strict academy school that exists to try and get the best possible qualifications for its students, many of whom whom come from very poor backgrounds. I had gone into this with a very broad idea, thinking that very much like Anne-Marie, I would be leading my pupils on sort of school trips every other day. I would be doing debate club. I'd be teaching them how to be journalists. I had this sort of terribly romantic idea of myself as a sort of... um, uh, too much of a cliche to say a sort of Miss Jean Brody figure, but something a bit like that. And I feel that I've had a real brush with reality. And the reality is that it's not actually my job to do that. It is my job. I'm an economics teacher and it is my job to try and help my students do as well as they possibly can in the exam that they are going to take. And this has been really difficult for me because I'm kind of a hippie at heart. Um, And I've really had to do some sort of soul searching on this. But if I really care about my students, and I absolutely do, isn't it therefore my job to use my available time with them to try and help them to get those grades that will open doors to them and help them lead better lives and if I'm doing that can how much can I be doing of the Jean Brody stuff on the side well some and I hope what I do is valuable but not an awful lot and that's a sort of slightly sad realization that I've come to. How important Jeffrey, would you say exams are and having that really important 
academic instruction that children need to get through exams. I mean, the whole exam question has become really difficult in the last year or so because of the pandemic. How vital should they be? So I think exams are quite important. And when we talk about exams, one needs to consider what is the basis of that exams. I think the exam system allows for what we call the institutional form of cultural capital because that allows for exchange value and therefore it can lead to economic capital and opportunities that families may not be able to provide for their children. So I think high quality academic qualifications are quite an important feature of the best education system. And the UK has that within the current offer. I think where the problem arises is the sort of differential learning experiences that pupils have based on geography or the quality of of the school that you are in. And therefore, the outcomes tends to be very, very different when you start look at disadvantaged performance. So I would say that there's a need for some revisiting of what the exam system really is providing. But I, I think rigorous exams and qualifications are necessary for, more importantly, to address the inequality in society because knowledge is power and knowledge gives access to more knowledge. I think the school has a moral duty to create you know, an opportunity for all children, regardless of, of where their backgrounds really positions them within the school. And therefore, you know, providing a rich curriculum and interventions where necessary. So I, I'll give an example. Um, I was a head teacher at City of London in Sadiq. And I remember um, we had 65% on you know, disadvantage in the school. Now, it's not possible to say that because you have 65% disadvantage, you accept that performance in that school will be low. That, that is obviously equating that to low expectations. And we got to a point where we have to intervene through regular Saturday schools, you know, over the holiday period. And the effect of that is the disadvantaged pupils did better than the non-disadvantaged, you know, and and that is one of the things I feel schools can bring to bear in trying to somehow equalise what it is an uneven starting point, you know. How important are they in your school, in your teaching job, Lucy, this need to have rigorous education? for the exam structure? It's fantastically important. I mean, um, I absolutely agree what Geoffrey has said, that exams really matter. Exams are the most democratic thing that we have. Um, Exams open doors to students that would otherwise be closed. You can't argue, you know, if you have a nine in your GCSE, you can't argue with that grade. It's been done properly. So I completely agree. But I agree also that the system still isn't working properly. Um, I, my current sort of bugbear is that I don't think that students should have to be examined in, examined in every single different subject. So we're in this sort of crazy situation that that means they're doing so many exams. And if you're a teacher, you are teaching to the exam because you're not helping your students if you're not. So I've been in this sort of situation that make, really makes me want to cry of spending so much time teaching my students exam technique, how to answer a six mark question. And I really want to say, I, do, I couldn't care less about a six mark question. I care. Do you understand inflation? Do you know why this matters? Um, and I I do think, you know, as Jeff Brees already said, time teaching time is limited. And I think by forcing students to do those examinations in every single subject, we actually make them spend too much of their limited precious time in school doing things that aren't that useful. I think what I would like to see is they might take exams in two or three different subjects. They would take an English exam that would establish how good they are at structuring arguments. They would take a maths exam that would um, see how good they are at maths, maybe a science exam. But the students who do well in English also do well in history. They do well in all the other essay writing subjects. So we would really only examine them in two or three different things and let the other subjects be a little bit freer to teach them some of the 
other things, the sort of problem solving skills um, that Jeffrey was talking about earlier, maybe slightly more creative things, how to think too. I would like to see 13 to 16 year olds, that's the age range I teach, being allowed to think for themselves and being rewarded for doing that. So uh, I don't think we need a massive, complete and utter overhaul, but I think some tweaking at the edges is really quite overdue. Geoffrey, what's the role of a school in helping a child develop social skills, develop their character, learn how to live in the world? Yeah, well, I think um, one, one of the key functions of a school, apart from obviously the taught curriculum and providing knowledge to pupils, is to help shape behaviours. And schools have structures that allows pupils to cultivate good behaviours and attitudes that then put them in a good stead for adult life. And and I think the issue of character, so for instance, um, you know, getting pupils to be resilient, you know, um, show empathy, respect and consider other viewpoints. The curriculum and the activities that schools provide, so for instance, um, putting pupils in groups randomly, not necessarily by friendship, means that they, they tend to learn to work together and, you know, accommodate each other, whether... They, they don't always agree with one another. And I think by having those experiences, you start for start new relationship. You learn to, you know, make mistakes in, in, in a very controlled environment. So schools provide pupils the, the skills and the essential sort of um, attributes that um, one will need for further progression. I think more importantly, it's also worth recognising that school enables people to develop a sense of responsibility. Behaviours that are not positive in the school environment will be sanctioned or at least there will be some sort of discipline system. And equally, you get praise for good behaviour. So you tend to understand this sort of dial, what is right and what is wrong, and understand that those sort of rules in a school are mirrored in real-life society because society is... um, operates within a rule-based system. So although not all rules are written, you know, we still observe them. So I think schools are quite a good place to foster those understanding. Lucy, enormous demands are made on teachers from what I see from the outside, that you're trying to deal with rigorous education, you're trying to deal with discipline, you're trying to deal with race, you're trying to deal with, for example, the allegations of a rape culture in some schools that we've heard so much about recently. How do you deal with that enormous range of things that are expected of you as a teacher? Yeah, I emerged into teaching knowing absolutely nothing about it three or four years ago. I had been in the working at the Financial Times, which is more or less like a sort of senior common room. And then here I was in this hackney comprehensive with all of these issues that you talk about. Um, it was utterly bewildering, but mainly in a very, very good way. This is the community I live in. And so to the extent to which I was really up close and personal with it is is great. Um, the It's made me think much more deeply about race. I had lived in, a, an, in an almost entirely white bubble. What a privilege for me in my late 50s to find myself in a different community. Um, I mean, you know, I put my foot in it often enough by saying the wrong things, but my students are polite and nice and they kind of tell me I've put my foot in it and I apologise and we move on. It's all very civilised. I think... In terms of what is expected of teachers overall, which was was really your question, too much is expected of us, or rather maybe not too much, but inevitably the impossible is expected of us because we want every single child to do as well as they possibly can be. I couldn't have even ensure that for my own children. I only had four of them. I think it's terribly important that we as teachers do look after ourselves a bit and not feel terribly bad about all the things that we could have done better. So I think that the way of dealing with, you know, it all being too much is by saying, okay, you know, I did my best and I only have a limited amount of time. I only have a limited impact and that's enough. And otherwise I think you go completely and utterly nuts. Geoffrey, on this question of teaching having become so much more complex and the things that are expected of teachers becoming so difficult, 
How do you say this is how you tackle racism? This is how you deal with sex education? All those things that are included now in teaching economics or French or English. I, I think the teaching um, has always been a complex um, undertaking because um, I think schools represent part of the communities that um, they are located in. And sometimes we forget that. So I do recall most times if there is a problem in the community on Monday, you might have some of those problems coming into the school. But I, I think, you know, the specific one with racism, racism is about tackling any prejudice and stereotypes that exist in society. But I think the key thing for schools to tackle this by modeling what it is in terms of multicultural society. So, for instance, having governing board members that, you know, looks like the community that the, the school serves. So, again, recruiting teachers from diverse backgrounds that allow schools to be able to, in, in practice, you know, have open conversations about, you know, what it is that society needs to be addressing in terms of racial disparities or differentials that are not favourable to, you know, ethnic minorities. Lucy, as you're trying to encourage more older people to come into teaching, how easy is it to get their head around the modern world as it changes its attitudes to spelling, whether you should write with good grammar and good punctuation or not? and particularly the difficult question of gender. At what point is a teacher expected to call a pupil who was once a girl, has become a boy, him rather than her? How are older teachers getting their heads around these sort of very new difficulties? Well, I think they're very good for us, um, but let's take them one by one. Spelling and punctuation Schools are hotter on spelling, grammar and punctuation than they were when I was young. So actually, it's the other way around. In my hippie school, didn't really teach grammar at all. Um, in primary schools now, they teach grammar that I haven't even heard of. So I think that pendulum has swung back the other way. As far as the questions about transgender, in my experience, absolutely not a problem. I mean, the schools have policies just as they do on lots of things, and you just follow them. Easy. So I really don't think that that's the issue for us as older teachers. I think to the extent to which there is an issue, it's more accepting that whatever job you used to do, you might be able to play a, a role in shaping the rules. But now, absolutely not. You're beginning as a teacher and you must accept the rules of your school because schools really, they're quite rule-based places and they really only work if every teacher, no matter if they're in their late 50s, 60s, used to do something senior, it only works if everybody is pretty much doing the same thing. Another way in which I feel slightly um, disadvantaged on account of my age is that I'm maybe not quite as good on technology as some of the younger pupils, but I'm getting a lot better. So I don't, I don't think, I, I don't find that hard. Lots of other things I do, but not that. Just one final question. If safeguarding and sex education and all of these questions are being well handled. Why do we seem to have what's been described as a rape culture in so many schools? Why is that failing? I presume the culture in a school can lend itself to some of these accusations quickly, if not challenge at the first instance. But I, I think there is a problem with any school that has this sort of culture and, and they need to be, you know, held to account to change those culture because um, you can't be in a school and say you feel safe if what we, we've heard in the news is, is their practice, you know. And and it doesn't matter whether it's current or historic. Um, there's a root cause to this, which is maybe um, some kind of casual acceptance of behaviours that are deemed to be either less harmful or, you know, tolerant by the, the people that work in such environments. And Lucy, a final question to you. What would be the one thing that would improve your working life as a teacher? Oh, gosh, that's really hard. Uh, apart from more money, of course. More money would be nice. Um, slightly fewer hours might be nice too. I don't want to say the obvious answer, but I'm struggling to avoid it. I'm very ground down by the data. 
Um, I mean, I, I, I love maths. I respect maths. I think data on the whole is excellent. I just don't think we found a good enough way of using data to measure student progress. And so I spend an awful lot of my time putting numbers in spreadsheets when I don't actually respect the numbers. I don't think the data itself is somehow good enough. Um, and so I find that really enraging. It's a boring answer, Jenny, but it's true. But how would you do it if you think it should be done differently? How should it be done? How do you rate a student's progress? Yeah, it's really, really hard. If the answer was easy, we would be doing it an awful lot better. I think we measure too often. I think we, maybe I just think we take it too seriously. You know, we, we look at these numbers, but maybe you may be comparing two tests and actually one of them may have been easier than the other test. So you may get the whole class doing a lot better than they did last time, not because you're a brilliant teacher, but because the test is slightly easier. You know, there are all of these things so that it all just needs to be done sort of better and tighter, but to do it better and tighter involves more time and more time thinking about it. So the data, I can see why the children need it, but oh my goodness, give me less of it. And on the whole, you do still love teaching? Yes, I absolutely love being with teenagers, being in the class with them and teaching them something I care about, which is economics. What could be better than that? Lucy Kellaway, Geoffrey Quay, thank you both so much for joining us today. And to those of you who've been listening, join us again soon for another Now I'm Grown Up. Now I'm Grown Up is brought to you by Now Teach, a charity which inspires talented people to bring their experiences into the classroom. If you feel like a change and want to use your existing skills in exciting new ways, Head to nowteach.org.uk to find out how they could help you help young people like me. Or if you know someone who you think would be an amazing teacher, send them this podcast. Maybe it will be just the push they need. And don't forget to follow the show and leave it a rating on Apple Podcasts. Now I'm Grown Up is produced by Antonia Cundy and Theodora Leloudis. And the credits are read by me, Ty Holbert, age 13.